Uh, thanks everyone who is joining. We're going to start in a, a few minutes and let some people trickle in. Okay, hi everyone, we're gonna go ahead and get started. Thank you everyone for coming today and thank you to the MIT Club of Northern California for hosting this event. We're really excited to share a little bit about beekeeping with you. Um, this is my husband, Brian, and my name is Tiffany. Hi. And our title is to be or not to be, but spoiler alert, the answer is to be. We think bees are fantastic and we hope you'll agree with us by the end of today's presentation. We've been beekeeping for three years uh, as a family, uh, the two of us and our two kids who are eight and 10, we all help out and we have a lot of fun with it. So today we're gonna share that with you. Um, we'll learn about bees and get to see them in action, a uh, live bee demo through that bee cam that you see, that'll be a little bit later. Uh, so I encourage you to enjoy. And if you have questions as we go along, please just type them in the chat box and we'll try to address them at the end of the presentation. So I wanna start out by talking a little bit about um, the importance of bees. And uh, we all know that bees are an important source of pollination for our crops, for our flowers, and really for the whole economy. Um, I'm curious, this is a pop quiz. You can type your guesses into the chat box. How many different species of bee do you think there are worldwide? You can just go ahead and type in some, some ideas. This includes honeybees, carpenter bees, native bees, um, bumblebees, and on and on and on. Lots of different types of bees. Let's see, we've got 60, 200, 275, 25, 100, 1,000, we're getting a little bigger there. Any other guesses? Last chance. So actually Mark is the closest with his huge guess, there are actually approximately 21,000 different species of bee uh, that exist in the world today. That are described. That we know about, yeah. Um, and the really interesting thing is only seven, seven species out of that 21,000 make honey. So we only know about seven species of honeybee. So I actually feel really fortunate that humans figured out how to partner with these fantastic creatures to get honey and help pollinate and um, have a really interesting scientific experiment to do in our own backyard. You've also probably heard about the many threats to bees nowadays. Um, the average beekeepers uh, across the United States see 40% losses from year to year. Uh, that means that they lose about 40% of their colonies. And the three main reasons for those are pesticide use, um, different types of parasites uh, that prey on the bees, and also loss of habitat and foraging area. Um, at the end of today's presentation, we'll actually talk about some ways that you can help uh, to do your part to help our bees. So we're gonna, um, I'm gonna first give you a little bit of a visual on how important bees are. So the, um, let's see, there we go. This is a photo of a grocery store produce department where you can see all of your favorite 
fruits and vegetables. And this was a setup that folks made to describe the real importance of bees in a visual way so that you can imagine what kind of an impact bees have on our food supply. So remember this photo, keep it in your memory, and then we're gonna see what disappears if we didn't have bees pollinating. This is now the state of our fruits and vegetables without bees, and that's not just honeybees, but that's other types of bees as well, um, other types of those 21,000. Um, and as you can see, huge impact on our food supply, huge impact on our economy, and that's why people are concerned about bees, and we wanna do what we can to try to save not only honeybees, but also native bees of all types around the country. The next thing we're gonna talk about is a little bit about the life cycle of a bee. It all starts with the queen bee that you've heard of. Now, if you open up a hive and you look for a queen, it can be hard to find her because an active hive in the summertime has about 50,000 bees in it, uh, and there's only one queen. <laughs> but if you know what you're looking for, you can spot her um, if, you, if, if she's not trying to hide from you. She typically has a longer body with a slightly pointy abdomen. So if you think you've spotted her, I will let you know if you did. There she is. Uh, and so the queen bee starts by laying eggs. Um, that's her main job in the hive is reproducing the colony. Uh, another pop quiz for the chat box. How many eggs a day do you think a typical queen bee lays? You can go ahead and uh, type your number of guesses into the chat box. 2,500, 400, 10,000. I guys, I got you guys primed for large numbers because of that first, that first pop quiz. Um, so actually about 2,000 eggs a day um, is what a healthy queen will lay. Um, and that's how she keeps the population going. So it stays as an egg for three days. This is a photo of some eggs in the honeycomb. Keep in mind, this is very zoomed in. Uh, so the eggs are very tiny. You can see them with the naked eye, but they're tough to see. Um, and we're hoping we might be able to show you some eggs on our real honeycomb later today. After three days as an egg, the eggs hatch into small larvae. So on this slide, on the far left-hand side, you can see little tiny larvae worms um, swimming around in royal jelly there. Um, and as you go a little bit more towards the right of the slide, or towards the middle, the worms are bigger and fatter. Those are older larvae. Um, they spend six days as larvae. And after that, the worker bees cover the top of the larvae with wax to close it off. And that's what all these yellowish brownish bumps are in the right lower quadrant of the screen. That's what we call capped brood. So it's larvae that have been capped off with wax and they're now in their private little compartment where they can change from a worm into a bee. It's a lot like when a caterpillar changes into a butterfly in its cocoon. And that takes about 12 days. That's the pupa stage. Um, after that 12 days, the adult bee is ready to hatch. It has to chew open its own wax capping to get out of its cell. And we call it the bee being born, although it's, it's really an adult at that point. But it's fun to see new bees just uh, chewing their way out and crawling out of their, their little cells. Anything you want to add to that? Uh, are you talking about their first job? Uh, we're going to go into that okay. next. So before that, I want to show you guys an amazing video. It's a time lapse video sped up of the bee life cycle. Um, so I'm going to pause this share, share another video. And uh, yeah, I can probably be full screen. Aha. Okay. It's creating a black box or anything. I don't think so. Can you guys see, uh, can I get like a yes in the chat box if you guys can see this video ready to go? Fantastic, thanks Mark.
Okay, so I hope you guys enjoyed that. Um, whoop. <laughs> There's pause, so oh, good. they didn't. Had some extra video going there with some sound, but. Uh, Autoplay. Uh, anyway, there was a, a little Easter egg in there. If you were paying close attention, um, the part where there was a bunch of bees in a row in rows, um, you might have noticed, or a bunch of pupae, sorry. You might have noticed small brown mites crawling around quickly in the time-lapse video. Um, those are the beekeeper's nemesis, Varroa mites. Varroa destructor. They crossed over from Asian honeybees, which uh, have various strategies for dealing with them and are very minor pests for, for Asian honeybees to European honeybees several decades ago. It would, the European honeybees did not have much of a mechanism for dealing with them. So a large part of managing bees anywhere outside of Australia, where they still have not yet shown up, is dealing with those varroa mite parasites. So we're really more mite keepers than bee keepers. <laughs> we're trying, trying to not be mite keepers, actually. Um, so thinking about the different, the different types of bees in a beehive, um, there are three types of bees. There's one queen bee per colony. There are about 90% of the bees are worker bees and they're all female. And about 10% of the bees are male and they're drones. Um, and the drones primary purpose is to fertilize queens uh, during the right time of the year. But all the rest of the jobs are done by the female worker bees. And honeybees actually have what's called division, age related division of labor which means that they have different jobs based on how old they are. So the very first job that a bee has is cleaning out her own cell when she's born. Um, she has to clean out the cell that she uh, hatched out of so that it can be ready for new eggs to be laid in there. Um, and then they go on with other types of housekeeping. Um, as bees get older, um, they take over a job of nurse bees, uh, which means that they take care of the eggs and larvae, providing food, keeping them warm, um, then they go into a broad category that you could just call hive management. Um, so that's really taking care of the business of running the beehive. Um, this is a frame uh, that shows lots of different things that bees do. So top left corner, we have capped honey. Uh, the orangey brown stuff is pollen. Uh, in the bottom middle, you can see some open larvae and bottom right corner, some capped, capped pupae. Um, but some of the jobs, um, we'll talk about some of the variety of jobs that they have, it's lots of different things. So for example, they build honeycomb. Um, they, there's, there's some young bees produce wax in their, ab or in their thorax. And that, that wax, they take this, this when, they're, when there's an abundance of honey and they're eating, or nectar, they're eating lots of sugar. They produce this wax, then they take it and kind of press it together into the honeycomb shape. They can also recycle wax from those cappings from other places of the hive to build new honeycomb structure. Other bees are undertakers. Their job is when old bees die in the hive to haul them outside. There's, uh, there's, 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 there's guards at all the entrances whose job is to make sure only bees from that hive get in, they use chemical signaling, they, they sense what chemicals are on the other bees coming in to make sure that it's, it's not robber bees from a different hive, from a different queen. There's bees that will, one of the nurse bees jobs is to produce royal honey to- Royal jelly. Royal jelly, sorry, to feed the young worms. The queen eats, a, at some point they cut off and start feeding the young female larva pollen, which it's actually endocrine inhibitors in the pollen that plants probably produce to make sure nothing's eating their honey that stops the bees' ovaries from developing. So there's nothing special in the royal jelly. It just is a much purer form of protein that allows the, the female bees to fully develop into queens. The nurses also a very important job is thermal management. The brood must stay around what 95 to 98 degrees 
at all time, even if it's a cold part of winter. So there, there are bees whose job it is to create heat. They can detach their wing muscles from their wings, and so they vibrate their wing muscles and generate heat. Uh, other bees, when they're doing that in the winter, will interlock their legs as kind of hairs and form an insulating ball. Uh, when it's very hot, they will bring water into the hive and evaporate it to keep the temperature low to, from, from getting too high. They, for their own swamp cooler going with, they'll beat the water with their fans. Also, they'll beat nectar to evaporate that moisture. They'll yeah, because nectar, when they collect it, it's about the same consistency as water. And as we know, honey is a lot thicker. And so they have to flap their wings to evaporate the extra moisture to make that into the thicker honey consistency, which the reason they do that is because honey will last longer. It won't uh, it won't mold, it won't go bad because it is such a high percentage of sugar. So it's the bees way of saving their food throughout the long winter. They're very particular about where in the hive certain things go. When a forager comes in with a belly full of nectar, it will transfer it to another bee. They might move it around several times as it ages and cures and, and becomes honey. Are we talking about that later? Yeah, so the, um, just the last job uh, of the oldest group of worker bees is the job of foraging. Um, oh, hold on. Before that, I want to show you this cool picture. Um, there's something bees do called festooning, which is when bees form a bridge or a clump with their bodies stuck together. And it looks really cool and it's really odd. And scientists aren't 100% sure why they do this. Some, some people think that it's because they're trying to measure distances within the hive to see how much wax they need to build to fill with honeycomb but it's, it's not obvious that that's really what they're doing. So uh, we'll probably see some festooning bees when we open up the, the hive later. So the last job of an adult, uh, the oldest group of worker bees is foraging. Um, and foragers can travel up to two to three mile radius around the hive. So they're really covering a large territory um, and collecting both nectar and pollen so that they can bring it back to the hive. Uh, as we know, the nectar, they're gonna fan into honey. The pollen is their main protein source. And they even sometimes mix the two together to form something that's called bee bread that it ferments. It does, yeah. There's, there's a fermentation process involved that partially detoxifies the, the pollen. So on this photo of a forager, close, extreme close up, you can see little bits of yellow fuzz all over the bee. That's little tiny bits of pollen. And the bee uses its front legs to kind of scrape the pollen backward and stick it into a big ball on their hind legs. You can see right now there's a big orange ball on something called a pollen basket. It's not literally a container like a basket, but it's a spot on the legs where pollen sticks to it easily. And that's they've, how they carry around their pollen. They've got longer, more bristly hairs that will hold it into place. Beekeepers like to call these pollen pants. When they see bees coming into the hive with pollen pants, they get all excited. And pollen comes in lots of different colors. Yellow and orange are probably the most common, but sometimes we see green pollen, red pollen, purple pollen, and the bees are very organized. They don't mix colors. If they have red pollen, they will put it in another cell with other red pollen. It's a great way to keep track of the seasons. Uh, starting in this area in the Northeast and in February even, you'll see like a, Weeping willow pollen start to come in. It's this kind of a, a light green color. It's followed by maple pollen, which is a dark red. And as you get into spring, you'll see dandelion pollen, which is a golden dandelion color. So very interesting to see the different colors of pollen and try to guess where they came from. And you may be wondering how they find their way around in such a huge forage area. And how do they tell their buddies back at the colony where to go? Um, a lot of people have heard of the waggle dance, and I'm going to show you a quick video of what it looks like so that we can talk about it a little bit more. So it's a figure eight pattern. Where in the middle of the figure eight, they do what we like to affectionately call the butt wiggle. in the same direction when they go through the middle. They do a circle on the left and a circle on the right. Let's get ourselves out of here. 
out of there. Stop. Okay, so the the way the waggle dance works, do you want to explain the different parts of what it means? Sure, I, I'm not, I don't know exactly, but there's there's different patterns they'll make based on how far away it is. They have a code for close to the hive, they have a code for medium of the hive, and they have a, a different dance for something that's far away. And then the direction they go is what? The same direction, the direction of the sun. relative to the sun? Yeah, so the way, if they're going straight up on the frame, that means that the flower they're trying to tell their friends about is the direction of the sun, um, probably the sun midday, because I know the sun's going to be in different positions. Um, if it's going to the side, to the left side, it means it's to the left of the sun. And the speed of the waggle also helps them to understand how far away to go. So that's how they can spread the information throughout the hive. Beehives, they're, people sometimes think the queen is in charge of the hive. That's really not how it works. It really is a hive mind of all of the worker bees that make decisions collectively. The queen is kind of like a slave that just lays eggs all day. There's, there's attendants that will push her around where they want her to lay. Or sometimes if they, are we going to talk about swarms? Uh, yes, we sure are. So I'll wait for that. <laughs> As the next topic is um, the last the last part of our lecture portion of today before we go open up the beehive is just to talk a little bit about swarms. So when people hear the word bee swarm, they get nervous. They think it's something dangerous that they should watch out for, especially if you see it. Um, it can look a little bit disconcerting. A giant clump of bees. This is a typical swarm. A giant clump of bees on a tree could be on a post. Uh, you may have seen the video, we're in New Jersey, but I think the video showed nationwide of bees on a beach towel in New Jersey at Cape May. Um, it's, it's worrisome if you're not familiar with bees, but it turns out swarms are just how bees reproduce their colonies in nature. And uh, what happens is when a colony gets too large or sort of the other side of that is if they don't have enough room to lay in more eggs in their hive, they will decide that they need to split and have half the colony leave. So what the process is, is those worker bees will make that decision and start raising a few eggs to be queens and not just worker bees. Um, they'll build extra long cells since the queen is larger, she needs more space as a pupa and they'll continue feeding her royal jelly past the point that workers get it. And they'll, they're called swarm cells because it's a beekeeper's clue that your hive wants to swarm soon. When those eggs, or sorry, when those cells are ready and the queens are developing, the old queen who has just been hanging out in the hive so far, she will leave, which doesn't happen any other time after she's mated. She'll leave with half the bees and go fly. And first they'll land somewhere nearby, like a tree branch while workers go around and try to find a good place to go. And once they find a new home, then they'll leave. So typically they're not there very long, the place where people see them out in invisible areas. And they're also not aggressive because they're not protecting any honey stores. They're not protecting any eggs or brood. And it's the most docile that you'll ever see bees is when they're in a swarm. Did you want Should to we share with Jessica's? Or? No. Okay. <laughs> Um, so that is it for now. We are going to switch over to the bee cam to start showing you inside the hive. A little caveat, originally we were going to take you outside and open up one of our regular hives. However, as I mentioned, we're in New Jersey and we are in the middle of tropical storm Isaiah right now and we have high winds. The rain seems to have stopped after we got a few inches. So long story short, we brought a few frames out of a beehive yesterday and put them in our garage. So we'll be taking a little field trip to the garage to see the bees today. This is a photo of part of our apiary. And um, we currently have, is it six colonies? Yes. yes. A reason. <laughs> Let 
them yet. The reason I wasn't sure how many colonies we had in the spring, we had our hives started swarming like crazy and then we would catch the swarm and try to put it back in a new box. So at one point we were up to 12, but then we sold some to nearby beekeepers who lost their bees and we combined some and now we're back down to six. Some of the weak ones, yeah, we've put it back together. We started with four or five, yeah. It's amazing how hard it is to keep track of colonies, let alone bees. We try not to, uh, we try not to. Do you want to stop sharing? Bees. So I'm going to stop sharing. And maybe we can make the bee cam primary. Oh, let's start video. Here's the bee cam. Uh, yep. Okay. okay. So first step. You can see the, the storm is somewhat calmed down out there, but it's still relatively windy. We will. <laughs> Back out into the into the outdoor hives that so, you said she prepared. The first step is we got to get our protective gear on. So bees, um, they're usually they don't want to sting you because they'll die if they sting you, but they will sting if they feel that the colony is at risk. So for example, if you go opening up their hive, they get pretty mad and want to try to get you out of there. So that's when we are going to um, put put on. Oh, I'm going to flip the camera around so we can see this little. Demo. Okay, so I tuck my socks in, I tuck my shirt in. Uh, some more experienced beekeepers will go out wearing only a veil and use the bare hands. We're not comfortable doing it, that at this point. Um, we have a relatively inexpensive just coveralls that will protect our face. Uh, and then have some leather, long leather, long sleeve leather gloves. Now, if you make the bees mad enough, we found that they will find a way to sting you. So the keys to keeping the bees from getting too mad are slow, gentle movements, think Tai Chi, kind of not jerking things in their own, not startling the colony too much. And secondly, uh, the bees use alarm pheromones to communicate. Uh, a lot of people, if there's a really aggressive hive, can, can practically smell the banana smell uh, it's, that their alarm pheromone is sim smells similar to. Um, another pheromone they use is to like mark a new home. If they, if they are swarming, where they'll try to do uh, tell all the other bees this is a good place to live. And that scent kind of smells like lemongrass oil. And in fact, if you're trying to lure a swarm of bees, then you put lemongrass oil or something similar inside a box. So we'll let Tiffany also demonstrate her, throw on her suit. But uh, a very effective way to block those pheromones is a little bit of smoke. So this is a Foundational device of modern beekeeping, it's a smoker and ancient beekeeping that use a burning branch. As soon as people had fire, they said, ah, it makes it a lot easier to get that, get that honey. Um, but it's not just purely disrupting, or it's not, uh, a lot of people say, oh, it makes the bees think that the hive is on fire and that they'll need to gorge themselves on food, but it is somewhat more than that. So. If you are going to get bees, there are three ways to get bees. One is you can put out a box. You can, that's the right size, yeah, hopefully up in a tree. Sometimes it works on the ground and try to catch a swarm. Or if you see a swarm in a tree, you can throw that swarm into a box. The second way is you can buy a package of bees. How's the audio? I guess I <laughs> The second way is you can buy a package of bees, and that uh, a package of bees comes with one queen and a bunch of adult workers, and you put them in a hive and hope they get to work building honeycomb and laying eggs to continue the colony. Take three pounds of bees, you put them in a box, you hope they decide that that's where they want to live and not fly away. And the third way to get bees is to buy what's called a nuke, short for a nuclear hive, which is like a miniature hive, which is what we have right here, this little box. 
This is how we got RVs when we first bought them. And this is what we're using just to store a couple of frames to show you guys today. It's, it's the nucleus of a hive, like the nucleus of an atom that's the center. So it's got all the important parts. So it comes with, uh, very importantly, a laying queen and all of these that are related to her, uh, together with uh, their brood is very, once they have brood, they'll want to stick around them and protect them. And also we'll have a lot of honey and resources in there. So when we first lift up this cover, when we first lift up the cover of the nuke, I bet that they might be festooning down from it. So it'll be fun to see if they are, if they like to. Nope, not today. Okay, they were yesterday, but that's all right. <laughs> so we just took a couple of frames out of our beehive. So a honey beehive, the most common type is kind of like a file cabinet. It's a big box. Oh, we're gonna open the garage door. I'll get uh, a little more ventilation with the smoke in here. Pardon the noise. You can see uh, over there in the distance our actual apiary. So a beehive is kind of like a file cabinet where they're, these are the files that you pull out and that's where they build their stuff on. Each, um, each box you see in the stack is just the outside of a box with a little lip to rest frames on it. But the top so, is open and the bottom is open. So you have to have a separate bottom piece and top piece. So traditionally have eight or 10 frames, usually 10 frames across there. But again, this is a little very convenient box. So let's see what we have on the first frame here. It's heavy. If it's heavy, it usually means it's got honey. So, okay, we're going to be able to step outside a little bit because it's not raining right this minute. Uh, right in the middle, look at that bee. Oh, we got a bee being born, guys. That's very exciting. I'm going to point to it with my finger. And you can see she's just starting to come out of her cell and start her life as an adult worker bee. In other parts of this frame, we have nectar. The shiny stuff you see is just nectar that they've collected. And once they decided that it's a um, thick enough consistency to be uh, long lasting, then they cap it over with, honey, uh, with wax. So this, uh, this is all covered with a wax cap and this is honey now. This is something that a beekeeper can harvest. So they'll, the nurse bees will sometimes go grab some nectar or honey to to feed to the larva so you can see she's up there drinking away at the top or maybe that's a newly born bee that's thirsty anything on the other side um we got more capped honey so these two tools this one is called a frame grabber it makes it easier to pick up the frames this one is called a hive tool and it's good for lots of things, but mostly for um, prying things apart after the bees stick it together. Down at the bottom, you can see, so this, we're using something called foundation that you start off with a plastic grid that's the same size as the worker cells that oh, they build off there's another one of. being born over there. And, and down at the bottom of this frame, you can see that they've built larger cells. So they like to have a significant amount Smaller of drone cells, brood. larger cells. The, the drones, the male bees, the larger ones, they like to have about 15%. Beekeepers like it to be much lower than that often. There's one drone uh, I see capped on there. Do you see it, Tiffany? Yep. Yeah. So they kind of stick out a little farther. The drones are bigger, they've got much bigger eyes. They've got one we've job got, in life. We've got a ton of bees being born here. We've got one there. Got one there, one there. This is a happy we have, birthday. We have one that's sticking her butt out that just was born that's cleaning it out. Can you see that one up toward me? Oh, yep. Oh, oh a different one. Yep. <laughs> All right. So the should... drones, is that a drone being born here coming out? Mm, yep, maybe. Big eyes. So they've got big eyes. They've got one job. They'll stay in the hive maturing after they hatch for a few weeks. And then every nice day, it's their job to eat honey and nectar and go fly around to what are called drone congregation areas. So there's certain areas, apparently you can see them on radar, every few miles where all the bees know 
the, that's where the queens are going to go and the drones just their daily commute is to just go fly around and wait for a virgin queen. We, I can see a couple of drones right here in the middle. Well, the drones are kind of the big fat bees. Sometimes people say, oh, is that the queen? It's bigger. If it's big and fat, it's a drone. And if it's long and skinny, it's the queen. Especially looking at the eyes. You can really see the eyes. So we, a lot of people say they are useless. They do help somewhat with the thermal regulation of the hive. So we and, tried really- And also they contribute pheromones to the hive that if say there's no, no drones being born, the, the bees might think there's something wrong with the queen and it's time to get rid of her. So you so. can see some fat larvae in here, the fat white worms. Um, it looks like they're maybe in the process of capping over because I see here if I blow on them they'll usually get out of the way. You can see some of them are partially capped. They're probably in the process of capping over the, the fat larvae for them to become pupae. Any eggs over here? Let's see. We're looking to see if we can find any eggs for you guys to see. Um, you probably will not see the queen. When we took these three frames out of the main hive yesterday, we tried really hard not to get the queen. We looked for her and didn't see her. So hopefully we didn't get the queen right, because if right you take the queen room. out of the hive, the rest of the hive gets a little worried that they don't have a queen anymore. We go into emergency preparation mode and start, start taking some of those young larvae and we'll try to turn them into queens. Start feeding them royal jelly. Well, we got some more fat larvae in here. And like I said, we do use foundation. You can see the edge, the plastic edge of the foundation here, but you don't need to. It's, it's really a beekeeper preference. And we have some frames that don't have foundation and the bees will build the honeycomb into that hexagonal shape just out of thin air. I'll just build it hanging down. Hanging straight down. Okay, let's look at a third frame. Oh, supersede your cells. Well, emergency cells, they might have built overnight. So as soon as you put them in here, uh, they stop spelling the queen. They said, uh oh, there's no queen. So what they've done here and here is built these little cups where in another day or two, they might put a, one of those very young larvae and raise it as a new queen. So in fact, is we kept these three frames separate. You hear about beekeepers having 40% losses each year. Well, the flip side of that is it's relatively easy to split a healthy colony into new into two more they'll raise their own queen at usually about an 85 percent success rate and uh so these guys are well on the way we could if we really wanted more bees <laughs> let them keep going raise the queen and if in the, the queens hatch a little faster and in a couple weeks she'd emerge a week after that she might go on her mating flight then she'd get back and a week after that she'd start laying new 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 uh larvae so this is a very nice brood pattern here. Uh, beekeepers love seeing these frames full of brood. It means you got a got a healthy queen that's that's got. They only they only mate once, and they or uh, they might go out on a couple of mating flights in their life. And through that, up oh, I see a little parasite up there in the corner, Tiffany. You see that? Ooh. That is called a small hive beetle. And they run around and are incredibly tough. Squish like it with I the hive tool. Out. Squish it with the hive tool. Here, I'm, I think I got it with my thumb. But little tiny guys, they, the, the bees kind of corral them into corners, but they escape and try to lay eggs in there. And then the eggs kind of crawl under the honey and turn it to fermented slime. Very not good. So but a healthy colony should be able to keep them at bay. Um, there's something else that bees collect called propolis. Can you see the glue up here in the corners? So the main innovation of modern beekeeping is a combination of removal frames and something called bee space. So when I went pulling frames yesterday before the hurricane to show you guys, I wasn't able to find much pollen to show you, but there's a little bit 
of pollen in here, you can see kind of yellowish orange, not the shiny, the shiny is nectar, but the stuff that's not shiny, they've got a little bit of pollen stored in there. Sorry, I couldn't find more. And then, yeah, we don't have any drones. Go for that to show them the Uh, so you can see a nice example of how they build, even without the frame. Here's some wax that they're building just right off the edge into that honeycomb shape that they don't need a frame to build it that way. But they decided to build out a little fatter than the frame that we gave them, and they continue that pattern. All right, should we? Uh, so B space. Oh, B -space yeah. B space I talked about. So. If, if there's a space in here that's smaller than 3 16 of an inch, like, like the edge of the frames here, they filled it up with that B glue, the propolis. I like to seal up the cracks in their hive. And if there's a space bigger than 3 eighths of an inch, they will build honeycomb, build fill honeycomb it. in it. So, but when the frames are nice and snug like they should be in the hive, you, you leave between each top in the box, a space that's bigger than 3 16 and smaller than 3 8 And that magical dimension of an inch, and that magical dimension is called B space. And that's what they use to move around their hive. They won't fill it up, so. So this box is made to fit five frames. If we left them like this unsupervised for a week or two in the height of spring, they would fill up this huge empty space with a whole you bunch of them. crazy honeycomb. You can see them starting from the top, but they fill. Here's some white wax, new white wax that they might have even started to build down yesterday. And that's, that's, so they, they would just fill that whole thing with crazy fur comb. Fur comb is what beekeepers call any comb that they think is in the wrong space. Sometimes we joke that bees don't read the manual. Where's the stone to put back? Oh. So we're going to head back inside and then we'll be able to take questions. One last important part is before, when you're done working with the bees, you help out your partner with a bee check. So we check to make sure they don't have bees anywhere on their bee suit. Oh, there's one on your head. There's always one on your head. Show it to them. Yeah, there's always a someone trying to get a free ride. Here, Brian, check me. Check me. Uh, good. Good, good, good. Okay, we're gonna head inside and then we will open it up to questions. Gotta take off my B gloves to be able to work the touch screen on this thing. Okay. Uh, we can talk a little about harvesting. Okay. Well, let's uh, let's take some questions first. Oh. So here's a chunk of comb we pulled out that it was relatively it was it had I think drone brood on the back, but I pulled all those guys out, and now I've got a chunk of just honeycomb that you can you can uh, a lot of beekeepers sell it and suspend it in other honey, and you can just Take a bite and munch it. Our kids call it nature's chewing gum because it's sweet and chewy and you typically chew on it for a little while until you get all the honey out and then you spit out the racks that's left yeah, in your mouth. Chewing gum. So in an area, the, there might be several periods where lots of trees are producing nectar. These are some frames without bees. <laughs> They're in our house. So these came from the comb, the honey, and we're just waiting to get a few more. The reason the that end. they look shorter is they're from a shorter box called a medium box. What we saw before was called a deep box. And uh, beekeepers typically put these medium depth boxes on top to collect the excess honey. Because a box, a deep box full of honey will weigh well over 100 pounds. A 10 grain <laughs> deep box. And that's a lot of box to lift. Now, there's other ways to set up bees. Uh, this, this kind of style of. Questions. Okay. There's some questions in the oh. chat. Maybe Serena can read them out. 
Sure. Uh, the first question from Jan is, how does the encapsulated larva get oxygen? Mm -hmm. Great question. The wax must be permeable to oxygen. I haven't thought of, well, I've thought about that, but I don't know definitively, but that's, that's my guess is that oxygen and CO2 probably diffuse through the wax that maybe, I don't know if they leave micro pores or, or, uh, Oh, are we switching back to there? Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay, switching from the BCM to the laptop. Yeah, sorry, we don't have a great answer for that. <laughs> nice question. No problem. Yeah. Why are your hives on blocks? Well, uh, bees naturally want to be about above about 15 feet up in a tree. A swarm will, a lot of people think, show a preference. I mean, sometimes they land on a beach chair, but uh, that, that probably wasn't where they were staying. They, they're definitely looking for hollows in a tree. A lot of beekeepers say you should put your, your swarm trap box up high in the air. Other people say, you know what, I've caught them on the ground. So there's, there's, a great, there's, there's a famous saying that if you ask five beekeepers, you'll get six answers. Yeah. Because they never agree about anything. Um, so is it more so like personal preference than for you guys? Uh, no. So there's a very specific reason you might want them more than about 18 inches off the ground. And that's that skunks love bees and they will just sit there and munch on them coming out. Uh, they'll also, if you have yellow jackets, they'll dig out the, the whole nest. And yellow jackets tend to nest in the ground and skunks will excavate the whole thing and eat all the, eat all the yellow jackets and all the, the larvae and, that's that's one of their food. so bees is one of their favorite food. But if the entrance is up high enough, the skunk has to rear up on its on its back legs in order to munch them, and eventually the bees will start stinging the soft underbelly of the skunk. Oh wow! Did you find this out through um, by practice, or did you do research of this? Luck, no, research. luckily we we found it out the easy way, not the hard way. <laughs> that's great. Uh, another question is, what is the composition of the royal jelly and how is it formed? It is a protein food. Um, the worker bees I, make it in their bodies. A, I, I think it's amino acids, water, and lipids. Um, it's got, it, it's kind of got like a vitamin -y taste. Kind of like Flintstones vitamins, if you ever, if you remember the two of the right vitamins. <laughs> as, as is pollen, if you ever try that, but. Um, a lot of people think royal jelly is this magical substance that will cure all diseases. But as we mentioned, it's actually fed to all bees, not just the queen. It's just that the queen doesn't get her food switched halfway through. And yeah, there's, it's, it's not something magical in the royal jelly that turns her into the queen. It's what's not or it's, it's the stuff, it's, it's an, you know, anti-hormones in pollen that okay, turn okay. all the rest of the bees into worker bees. That not, the queen doesn't get. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, we have another question here. How much maintenance is required to take care of the bees? So the, it depends on the time of the year in the winter. We might do one or two interventions on a warm day. Nothing, mm -hmm. almost you nothing just, from November through March. You we, basically, it's a good idea to insulate the hives so that they don't have to work we so hard to keep them warm. But some people in Minnesota just let them sit there in the wood and they do fine there, so. But otherwise um, in the spring, they require more attention to avoid the swarming. You don't want your bees to swarm because then you lose half your bees. So you want to try to prevent swarming. Um, Unless you want more hives and then you... I would say in the spring then you we were split. doing a couple hours per weekend um, with the five to twelve hives that we had at any given time. Um, and in, this, in the summer, like right now, there's again not that much attention. We haven't gone into the hives for several weeks now. Um, and then in the fall, you want to be sort of checking in on them to make sure they're prepared for winter and they're ready to go into the winter. So I, I tell people one, one to two hours a week for six months out of the year, and then not much the rest of the time. Okay, that's cool. 
guess maintenance. Doesn't seem too bad. They, they're largely it's pretty take low care maintenance of yourself, compared to other pets or agricultural animals. Uh, except that if you don't do anything about the varroa, they will tend to collapse within about a year or two. They'll yeah. dwindle down to nothing. Yeah, so so that's, we, we give our bees different medications to uh, yeah. get rid of the varroa. Yeah, various interventions you can do. Uh, so the, the varroa, it's, it's a fascinating little mite. It, it crawls in just as they're about to cap it over. And then it lives in there and it will lay. It, it crawls into, crawls the, into the larvae cell before it the gets larva capped. The larvae cell just before it's capped when there's a nice fat larva. Then it lays a series of eggs, one male egg and then a series of female eggs. Uh, the male egg mates and then, or the male baby mates and then dies. Um, then when, when the bees on cat or when that bee comes out, uh, there will be four or five varroa mites that come out and a week later they'll head into new cells. So it's exponential growth. And there's not much defense that these, that, that honeybees have against it at the moment. There's some hygienic strains that maybe when there's, there's a bee in distress will haul that whole larva out and then the varroa has to go. There's, there's other beans that kind of hyper groom. So we're hoping to build some uh, genetic resistance in, but areas when it, when it showed up in the 80s, there were tons of synthetic miticides that were available. And so that's what we used and did not give the bees a chance to develop resistance. If 98% of the bees had died, then the 2% that were left would have probably genetic resistance. But we're at the point, we're, we're very far from that point. So, um, Okay. So how many uh, hives can one hive be split into? So most commonly you would, if you had a strong, healthy colony in the spring coming out of winter, like gangbusters, you would probably split, <clears throat> just do one split, split it into two. If both of those, sorry, I thought I heard a bee buzzing. <laughs> uh, if one of those um, seemed like it was still really doing strong and running out of room for the queen to lay, you could do another split. But the most common is just to split once to get but two hives from one. A lot of a lot of bee breeders will take 10 frames and if they each have queen cells, they'll split them into 10 hives and give them a frame of resources. So you can you can grow bees very quickly if you feed them. If the bees are doing well. You give them pollen, you give them nectar, there's a lot of nectar flow. Uh, ne by nectar, I mean sugar water or high fructose corn syrup, the industrial people use. <laughs> Uh, so here's a question of when and how do you harvest honey? So most commonly you harvest in the summer. <clears throat> Around July is the most common time. Uh, you, so in our, uh, in our hives, we have the a uh, couple of deep boxes on the bottom of the hive that is sort of the place where they lay their eggs and they raise their brood and they store honey to support their own colony. And if the hive's doing well enough that you can add extra boxes, extra space for them, then that's the honey you can harvest. You don't want to harvest too much honey or else the bees will not make it through the winter because they need their own honey to eat from. And so in some areas, including New Jersey, you can do a second harvest in the fall around September. From the goldenrod and aster. It just depends on the local plants in the area. Um, and, and I am seeing uh, somebody uh, oh, how do you harvest honey? That was the other half of the question. So those frames we have in there, we, we take the caps off. You can use either a capping fork that's got lots of tines that prize them up, or you can use a heated knife that cuts through. Some people just use a bread knife and saw them down to the surface. And then you, you prop them up in a spinner called a honey extractor. And you spin, we, we, You can do a hand crank one like we have, or if you're a professional, or there's, there's electric ones as well. Mm -hmm that spin it out so all the honey is flung to the outside of the tub and then slowly drips down the side. And then you open up the little spigot. Honey gate at the bottom and it out comes slows the out. liquid gold. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I see there's a couple more questions, but I just really quick wanna share my last slide um, that talks about ways that you can help bees because I see that we're almost to the end of our time here today. Um, just a few ways that you can do things at your own in your own home to help bees out. They're sort of rated from lowest effort to highest effort. 
So one thing you can do is buy local honey. You know, if you buy honey from local beekeepers at your local farmer's market, um, sometimes some grocery stores even have local honey from your region. Uh, that helps promote beekeepers and promote bees uh, being uh, propagated. Another thing you can do is host what is nicknamed a bee hotel. The bottom right of the slide has a photo, one example of that. You've probably seen these around in stores. Um, you might see them at parks sometimes. It's, this is not so much for honeybees, but for native bees that typically don't live in colonies. They typically live solitary in a solitary way. And having places for them to live can really help them out. They like to have small corners for them to burrow into. Um, or if you've got some woods, leave some dead wood. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it can be that simple. Um, plant, planting bee-friendly flowers and native plants. Of course, what's native will depend on what region you're in. And um, you can do research online about what types of flowers bees really get the nectar and pollen from, what, what they're most drawn to, and, and plant, planting some of those things in your own property. On the topic of gardening, trying to avoid pesticides and herbicides when you can, because a lot of these chemicals are showing up and really causing a lot of problems for worldwide bee populations. And of course, last, uh, becoming a beekeeper, that's our preferred method and a lot of fun. I know there, there was a question about that. Serena, could you read it out, please? Um, I see a, there's a question of how to become, or how to get a bee hotel. Uh, you probably buy one on Amazon. Garden stores. Or we're, not, we're not officially endorsing them, but you can buy them anywhere. Or yeah, mm -hmm. hardware stores. Uh, we have time for maybe one more question. Um, how many different species of bees are good for beekeeping? And how do you choose between them? Of which species? Uh, so there are more subspecies of European honey bee that are available in the US. I don't think anyone yeah, keeps Asian the same, honeybees here. They're all pretty much the same species of European honey, or of honeybee, but there's different varieties. There's the Russian, there's the Italian, there's the Carnolian. There's various hybrids. People, a lot of people are talking about Saskatraz. Yeah. It's again one of those things that different um, people have different opinions. That's, that's great if you're buying bees, but if you have bees and you propagate them, then whatever local bees are around you, whatever drones they're off mating, it's I, some commercial people probably do, but it's not impractical to keep your own bees mating with your own drones. So you'll eventually end up with some locally Lots. adapted bees, which is which is better than trying to bring in bees. Yeah, if you're from interested, Florida or Georgia to yeah. If, if anybody on the call is interested in starting beekeeping, the number one recommendation would be to find a local beekeeping club um, so that you can learn what works in your area, meet local mentors, that kind of thing. That's the best way to get started. That's a great idea. Uh, well, I think we can wrap it up for now. Um, I appreciate your time. We learned, I had certainly learned a lot about beekeeping and it was great seeing your little hive. How long do you think you are going to leave the that those boxes in your garage? Until We're going to put them back probably tomorrow. Like they said, they already they already built the weather. cups. In a few more days, they'll start building a queen. If we put it back in there and the queen didn't want to swarm, the a, a healthy queen should come over and and kill it. But if for some reason they did mature, the bees decided, you know what, we've got queen started now. Maybe it's time to swarm. Uh, uh, if you live in an area with Africanized bees, yes, a lot of people do like, or, or you can buy queens for $30 that are mailed to you that you might want to requeen uh, if, if your hive is getting kind of aggressive, you get rid of the old queens and then slowly introduce in a little box the new queen and hopefully they'll take her. Um, other people do keep bees in African areas, Africanized areas in Southern California with, with local bees, but just are very selective about if a, if a hive starts getting hot, it's called, if it starts getting aggressive, you squish the queen or euthanize the hive. You just have to be very, uh, it's sometimes Correct. the best thing to do. Even in New Jersey, uh, one of our beekeeper mm -hmm. friends had a, he has a video where he says, yeah, this hive is just the spring. He posted it at like, if you Google how to euthanize, it's very sad, but he's like, you know what? There's, there's no other safe way to deal with this hive, it's too aggressive. You know, you just walk anywhere near it and just get covered with bees trying to, that's the type where you smell the bananas. 
<laughs> well, thank you, Brian and Tiffany. This was oh, a great welcome. talk. We really enjoyed it. And thank you yeah. so much uh, for hosting, Serena. And thanks again to the MIT Club. Well, have a safe uh, rest of your day and hope uh, everything turns out okay with this hurricane. Uh, interesting note on the Africanized. So in Puerto Rico, they've determined that pretty much all the bees have Africanized genetics there, but have been kept and have now mellowed out. So even though is, is, the genes are not the destiny that, uh, or there's, there's multiple factors involved. So interesting, interesting little hope. side note there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> awesome. So. Well, thank you. Thank you.